Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I would just like to thank you so much for having me. Um, it's an honor to join you today for the Every Life Foundation's 2020 Scientific uh, Workshop. It's been wonderful working with folks, including Jamie, Annie, and others uh, in preparation. And um, I just have to also uh, thank uh, Jen for um, such a tremendous and important um, uh, uh, comments, um, uh, just uh, really um, highlighting the, the, the parent perspective and as, as a pediatrician, um, just uh, knowing how how important it, it was just every day uh, partnering with with parents as as really the, the experts on on their child's needs so thanks so much for that um, so I'll give you a little introduction uh, to our work um, uh, as as we know um, the, the cases are are tragically still increasing hospitalizations are increasing deaths continue to increase um, so even as the vaccine is rolled out um, just be sure to keep taking those same mitigation measures I know, uh, we're all tired, I am too, um, um, but um, continues to be so important. Um, so our work is on the disproportionately affected uh, populations team. And um, uh, we, our populations of focus are fivefold. So older adults, uh, persons with disabilities, persons in correctional facilities, persons experiencing homelessness and people who use drugs or have substance use disorder. Um, so the disproportionately uh, affected uh, populations team um, was established to ensure um, that there were designated subject matter experts on the CDC response that are focused on populations that are disproportionately affected by the pandemic. And our key activities include drafting and updating guidance for management of COVID um, among uh, certain populations and settings. Um, data collection and special studies uh, where possible, as well as in cooperation with our CDC field teams. Um, data analyses to answer key research questions and uh, better inform and address the response uh, with regards to our populations of focus. Uh, technical assistance to all of our state and local health departments, as well as tribal health departments. Um, uh, technical assistance to deployed field teams. Uh, we draft trainings and infection control assessments for workers um, uh, in settings uh, frequently serving our populations and engage with partners and stakeholders who work directly with our populations of focus to stay informed of emerging issues and concerns. Um, and I think that this is just really important that we're trying to be proactive, not reactive. We're trying to keep our ear to the ground. This is where partnerships um, with um, organizations and, and uh, patient advocacy organizations and, and, and other stakeholders is really important to keep us uh, informed of what those emerging and new concerns are um, so that we can do our best to, to create uh, responsive materials and let the response leadership know. Um, we also advise other task forces on the response on special considerations for our populations of focus. Um, so you may have noticed in listing those five populations that rare diseases per se are not an explicit focus of our team, but we do work very closely with our colleagues at the Division of Human Dis Development and Disability. And in collaboration with them, we certainly have had conversations um, with uh, rare disorder organizations with whom we work uh, closely. Uh, for example, Spina Bifida Association organizations focused on muscular dystrophy. Um, and CDC defines disability as any condition of the body or mind that makes it more difficult for the person with the condition to do certain activities and interact with the world around them. Um, so um, I want to be very explicit in acknowledging upfront that um, you know disease and disability are not the same. Um, certainly some people with a rare disease may be considered or identify as having a disability, but I just wanna make it very clear that I'm not, my intention is not to conflate those two concepts. Um, however, some of the work we've done around disability may be of interest, um, of particular interest to this audience. So I will focus on some of that during this talk. Um, we, there is a separate group on the CDC response that focuses on underlying conditions and which underlying conditions um, uh, increase uh, risk of a severe illness due to COVID-19. And um, we do interact with them on a regular basis as well and try to bring um, you know, new literature, et cetera, to their attention. Um, so early on in the pandemic, a lot of our focus was, you know, just on orienting people, doing guidance, technical assistance. Um, so I have, I will talk a bit about some of the guidance we came out with, and I can certainly provide a list of these um, to um, uh, Jamie and the organizers after this to share with attendees. 
Um, so uh, first we have uh, a web resource for direct service providers, um, which include you know, personal care attendants, direct support professionals and paraprofessionals and therapists. And um, this page addresses everything from how to protect themselves and their clients to how to cope with the stress of the pandemic. We also have guidance for caregivers, parents, and people with developmental and behavioral disorders. That includes content on developmental monitoring, college or graduate students, as well as parents uh, supporting children with distance learning. Um, we have content for group homes for individuals with disabilities, uh, which includes content on how to communicate with staff and residents, uh, screening recommendations, planning for essential outings, and uh, preparation for potential staff shortages. Um, guidance for people with developmental behavioral disorders um, or people with disabilities on prevention and preparation and the importance of following risk reduction strategies and continuing uh, routine care um, as uh, feasible, as well as managing stress and anxiety, which we acknowledge is a, is a huge um, challenge these days. And we have a toolkit for people with disabilities, which is a landing page that consolidates a lot of these resources. So we've also worked to get funding for um, some more uh, projects um, that address some of the concerns. So we're partnering with the CDC Foundation and the Center for Inclusive Design and Innovation at Georgia Tech uh, to rapidly assess, develop, and disseminate COVID-19 emergency response materials for people with disabilities in alternate form formats that go beyond the 508 standards. So Braille, American Sign Language, um, simplified text for individuals with low literacy, uh, et cetera. And um, we're also trying to develop culturally relevant considerations and resources for existing CDC guidance that reduce potential uh, barriers experienced by people in certain disability communities. And uh, for this, there are a number of disability organizations and other federal partners that are helping with our message creation, with our testing and dissemination. And uh, I will also supply a, a link where you can learn more about this effort. Other projects include uh, with RTI International, where we're expanding the creation of extreme low literacy materials um, uh, for uh, care uh, with beyond people with disabilities to caregivers and healthcare providers to ensure that they are uh, equipped to communicate in an inclusive manner. Um, and then we're working with Association of State and Territorial Health Officials and the National Association of City and County Health Officials and the Association of University Centers on Disability to address the needs of people with disabilities through inclusion um, in local preparedness and response efforts. And that project includes having disability experts or champions um, in several states to help lead uh, preparedness response as well as preparedness for future events um, and developing an online repository of resources. And uh, finally, we're working with the National Academy of S Science, Engineering, and Medicine to develop and disseminate interactive web-based resources for building cognitive behavior skills for children and adolescents and families coping with stress and anxiety during COVID-19. Um, so we want to acknowledge finally that we are uh, very aware of as well as appreciative of Every Life Foundation's active COVID-19 efforts and communications. Thank you too for your work, including your recent survey. And thank you so much for being active and engaged. This really is an all hands on deck uh, situation. And you know, it's, um, it's not just agencies, but it's the communities uh, behind us and, and reinforcing. So thank you so much for all that you're doing. Um, and now and in the future, I do see our work pivoting to support our vaccine task force as they look to gather data and inform recommendations, implement vaccination and do post uh, evaluation activities. And so our work can help inform ways to make this more inclusive and comprehensive of people in our populations of focus. And I know there are a lot of questions regarding prioritization of vaccine delivery, some of which Jen uh, uh, you know, mentioned in her talk. So um, the prioritization is determined by the recommendation of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices uh, comprised of medical and public health experts who develop these recommendations. And the voting members are scientific experts, which are external to CDC. Um, they will be meeting this weekend in two live sessions to discuss prioritization of the vaccine. All of their meetings are publicly viewable via internet live stream and no pre-registration is required. I will also send out a link regarding this, but if anyone is interested in making a public comment during these sessions, one will have 60 minutes of public comment and one will have 30 minutes of public comment this weekend. You may submit a request uh, via the instructions on the web before midnight on December 18th. Um, so be aware of, of that opportunity. 
Um, in terms of lessons learned on this response, um, definitely important. Uh, that's important to work hard to think creatively from an early stage in a public health emergency about how to collect data about the health needs, knowledge, attitudes, and practices of populations that may not be reached via traditional means of data collection in a way that will create a large sample. Um, and on a, on a personal level, you know, I've learned a lot about balancing. I have had my three-year-old at home most, most, of, the, most of the time. So uh, bouncing between, between conferences and presentations and, and, and uh, you know, nap times is, has been a learning experience as well. Um, and our team is working hard, not only to address the needs in the current pandemic, but to establish foundational work to put us a few steps further ahead and hopefully many steps further ahead in serving disproportionately affected populations in public health emergencies. That's all for me. Thanks so much for your time and thanks so much again for all that you do.